Welcome to Your Town. I'm Thomas Hood. It's my pleasure today to have with us Tolan Sand Glass Sculptor. Tolan's uh, origins in uh, California took him back east to New Hampshire and has had a number of exhibitions worldwide uh, to his claim as, as glass sculpture. He has had uh, collections and commissions with the Aga Khan Foundation in Paris, IBM, Coca-Cola, UPS, McDonald's. He has museum collections at the Bergstrom Mahler Museum of Glass, at the Albrecht Kemper Museum of Art, and at the Chattanooga Museum of Art. He has been in numerous exhibitions beginning early in his career, starting in 1977, all the way up to exhibitions through 2016. And we're lucky to have him back living in Carmel Valley. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Tom. It's good nice, to see you. Nice to be here. You've, you uh, describe your work better than I could actually ask in a question. If you don't mind, I just want to read a little excerpt that you, uh, you put together sure. here. And I think this, this will help us get a little bit of insight as to what, what goes on up here. I think of myself as an artist who is enthusiastic about architecture, color, and light. Uh, I had no idea where this journey would take me when a friend of mine gave me his stained glass business back in 1977. It's been an incredible exploration of all the qualities that make up glass as a medium. I've grown up artistically with what is called modern glass movement. I've been inspired by my peers as well as artists such as Isumu Noguchi, David Smith, Henry Moore, and Mark Rothko. I inhabit the symbolic, the cosmic, and the mystery. I love images that can come and go, are made bold, and then disappear, are reflective, and then not. The energetic and mystical side comes from teaching of my spiritual master, Sant Kirpal Singh, by whose instructions I meditate every day in my personal effort to connect and to be receptive to the vibration of the mysteries. I don't think we can cover this in 12 minutes. <laughs> tell me, <laughs> no, that tell me about this. That subject would take a lifetime. Right? Yes. So um, where do we start with this? Well, that's a good question. In terms of my California connections, I was born in Berkeley when my dad was in a master's program in political science there. And uh, he, he went on to work for the CIA, and so he moved out of the, of the state to, uh, to the D.C. area. Mm -hmm. But we had this connection that was always there for me because all four of my grandparents lived in Carmel Valley mm -hmm. and were, had, had deep roots there. My, uh, my mom's dad, Don Hale, uh, had the Hale Ranch, which became Carmel Valley Ranch. Mm -hmm. And so that was uh, our home base. Whenever we went on vacation, we were overseas, we'd come all the way back to Carmel Valley. And I remember every time that I would come here, it was like, ah, I'm home. You know? So I always had that, that sense of it, even though How I'd does home in Carmel Valley translate to uh, studying Noguchi, David Smith, Henry Moore. Where That's did that come question. from? Well, my mom went to Dominican College and okay. she, she in majored San in art in San Rafael. Mm -hmm. She majored in art and she told me not too long ago that they offered her a teaching position, but she decided to get married and have four sons instead. So, but that desire in her was always there and she, over the years, she would uh, exercise that, that desire. And one of them was when we lived in Athens, she got this big chunk of uh, Pentelicon marble, which is the marble the Parthenon's made out of. And it was on our, our marbleized floor outside uh, one, of the, one of the decks. And she would hand chisel away at it for hours and hours and hours. How old were you when you were watching this? This is like 15, 16, okay. something like that. And right. I, I never gave it much thought. I wasn't thinking, well, I want to do that. I, you know, I was being a teenager. I, you know, I just wanted to have fun, and uh, so the art thing really wasn't. Uh, it never crossed my mind that well, I could do this for a living. It really, literally, just fell into my lap, like I said, like you were reading in 1977 when a friend of mine gave me. And this. where we, where did this occur? Was this here this was in, in California? In, uh, in San Martin, New Hampshire. Okay. Uh, I lived on a dirt road there for 41 years. My wife and I bought four acres of barren land and built a little house and it got bigger and bigger and we had three sons and, and on and on like that. So it's just sort of uh, one of those things you start in, you don't know where it's going and you just sort of follow the, follow the scent. And Was there something out. about being essentially a modern day homesteader in New Hampshire 
being that close to the land, did that tie back to your time in Carmel Valley? Did, did, oh, it, did it help lead you to your art? Uh, well, I don't know about leading to my art, but it definitely, I mean, the whole the Carmel Valley experience was one of hiking in the hills. Eric and I would, with my older brother Eric and I, would just take off. I mean, we, we did that when we lived in Taiwan when we were even younger. We were like six and eight years old. We'd just take off into the rice paddies. So we, mm -hmm. we had that sort of that Viking adventure thing going on. And, and so mo living in the country was not foreign to me. I mean, it was, it was comfortable. I, well, I, you mentioned uh, Greece as a teenager, yeah. that it gave you a sense of otherness and exploration. Do you have a, a that same kind of sense of exploration when you're working in, in your glass now? Yeah, I How do. How does that I, connect together? That's a good question. Um, when, when I, I lived in Athens from 1963 to 1968, and even as a teenager, you, you can't help but notice the the ruins, the, you know, the the antiquity, the the Parthenon. It, it 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 you can't escape it being there. Right. And so you're you're aware of it in a sort of oblique way, but as time goes on, it becomes part of you. Well, let's pull up let's pull up these images because I think this will be very beneficial as you're describing. If we get our first image up here, because uh, I think you're you're hitting a very important point, and and I think your your piece here will probably describe this. Okay. Okay, you were talking about the oh, Parthenon right. in stone. Tell us what happens here. Well, this is, it, the way I treat glass is the way you would treat stone in terms of working with it. I don't use any heat. So I use saws, I use grinding wheels, I, you know, I, I, I can even grind it by hand, I can even mm -hmm. shape it by hand. A lot like the same way you would do with marble. So I'm sort of, I guess in my mind, now that you ask me, I'm thinking, well, I'm creating little Parthenons or, or little, you know, temples of Zeus or little, uh, you know, temples of Poseidon or whatever. They, they have a, but, but they're created as if it were 300 B.C. in Athens, where the, all Stone the temples tools. were, yeah, with, with very basic Machinery. If you saw my shop, you would say, well, that's pretty basic stuff. No, it's not laser beams. I've seen it. It is kind of amazing. <laughs> you know. Well, it's, it's, it's about as basic technology as, as you could get, and I'm sure it's the, the same thing they use to make is, the Was that decision to work on that way a deliberate decision, you know, to, to craft it that way and not use heat? Here's another piece up here that is um, No, no, it was, it was not. A, this is just an exploration of shape and form and color. Okay. In fact, I was, I was going to say all of the marble that the, the Greeks created was painted. It was colored. And so it's not unlike this, this piece here. I mean, it Tell has us colored about, highlights. Uh, look at the depth that's in here. These colors are actually inside this. And this object is, how, how big is this? It's got to be. It's about 10 by 10. Okay. It's not, not that big. But it's two cones right. that have been uh, cut into on the, on the ends, either flattened or... or or incised, and then put put together back to back with a colored element in between, and that allows the the color to be extruded basically mm -hmm. by your eyes as it's as it's turning. It will it will change. Things will magnify and then minimize, and and so it's That's it's what's happening right here. It's, yeah. And well, as as an architect, I look at these, and you're dealing with, you know. Euclidean solids, and you're dealing with a sphere, or you're dealing with a cube, yeah. or a, a, a pyramid, simple mm -hmm. shapes. So mm -hmm. there's sort of, you start with one thing, it appears, and sometimes there's a shift where it's split right. into two pieces, right. a sacred piece and a profane piece, right. but then something else happens inside, which is what gives it such a dynamic quality when light goes through it. Right. I, I, the idea is to create an interior that's very complicated mm -hmm. and then to add clear glass on top of it and that, then that interior gets refracted and reflected in the surface of the clear glass so that it... it what comes to mind when I see this? I mean, I'm looking at references to uh, Japanese cultural history. What, what was your inspiration for this? Well, that, but also the, the, the history of the trimarine in the Greek culture. Okay. And in the way that, in a couple of separate battles, uh, they defeated the Persians with their new naval fleet. And the oars probably were 
were similar to, to those ores. And to me, that's a seminal point in, in, um, in Western history because it prevented the Persians from marching into Europe. Mm -hmm. And we'd be a very different culture, a very different place, if that hadn't happened. So it's a, it's a hallmark of, of, of history, and I'm sort of commemorating it in a way that enlivens the, uh, the nature of it, the inside of it. It's, it's dynamic. What happens here? Is this an army of these pieces? <laughs> That's a good question. Because now you're you're using gravity in a different sense. You're defying it, right? This is on a vertical plane. Right. That's on that's on a wall that's about seven feet tall, and five feet wide, and the idea I think in those is is I think of those as souls, which is the light emanating mm -hmm. from deep inside us through our body, through our mind, through our energies, and they're all they're all different. It's like a group of I think there's 20, 24 there, a group of 24 different energies. And they all have different uh, graphics on them mm -hmm. which mark their identity, what, what their skills are, what their preferences are. They like blue, they like pink, you know, they, they like uh, letters, they like bicycles, you know, we're all that way. So you know? these are inanimate objects that actually could be representational of a soul or an event yeah. Or an ancient material. Yeah. I think but there's a history in, in each one of these pieces yeah, that you're trying yeah, to convey. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the the light of the soul is not an unfamiliar term. I think it even Plato talked about it and, and lots of other mystics too. And so I think of these things that they're not alive, but in terms of an inanimate object, they're about as alive as you can get. How does this tie into your uh, studies with your spiritual master? Tell me about what what you mean by your vibration of the mysteries? Well, um, basically my master taught a meditation that involved, involves um, reconnecting with the uh, expression of Godhead or higher power, however you want to call it, so that if you follow these expressions, you can get back to the origin of them. It's like following a path back to where it started or a, a river back to its origin. That you can have experiences of what people call God or the expressions of God by inverting your attention instead of having it out, have it go back the other way towards the soul rather than out into the world. And by doing that, you can have experiences um, of light and sound and experience what people call God in a, in a way that all the mystics of the past have expressed it, including in Persian mm -hmm. culture and Indian culture. And so in those pieces, for example, I the colors, the layering on the inside, is that a, can be interpreted as a, as a tangible manifestation of those spirits? Or are, are these more in an abstract sense. In other words, are we looking at something concrete that ties back to those teachings? I think they're both. It's like... Because they're elusive because it's glass. You see right. through it. Right. Well, that's so you it. don't really know if it actually exists the way you assemble these pieces. You, it's yeah. well, it's you implied have to, you and reflected. Have to focus your attention, focus your concentration to see the form. If you don't do that, the energy in the inside takes over. So it does have a, it does have a sculptural form. Mm -hmm. But you have to be careful and look at it carefully because it's clear glass. And it's only being defined by the refractions and reflections of, of the environment that it's in. So the, the, the colors are, are the energy. The colors are the energy, but the human being is the interpreter of what they're seeing. You can well, turn it. You can see it. It changes form. It changes color. Depending on which of a 360 degree view you're looking at, it's going to look different. It's not that not that unlike architecture. With without the presence of light, architecture doesn't exist in some people's minds. Totally. And and my my pieces are 100% dependent on on light. Even though in a totally dark room, there's enough light, and be, you'd be surprised. There's enough light 
to show that the piece exists because it, just a pinpoint of light will get refracted and reflected all through the piece. Here's you, another piece that yeah. I think is... Yeah. Is and if, if you took a laser beam fancy. and shined it on that, you would get 50 laser, laser points coming out of it because it would just bounce all around. Yeah, this, this piece is a 10 by 10 cube with some graphics on the inside and it's really a it's like a microcosm I mean it's so complex on the inside and these can be placed different orientation you're going to get different readings from every angle different, every time of day exactly and it, it spins and you can place it on different sides so now these are all produced in your studio at 28 West Carmel Valley Road they are little tiny space little tiny space how can people get in touch with you and when will your studio be open they can come out and see some of your work well the studio will be open um, every day except Monday from 9 to 5 approximately and uh, just just come on by I'm, I'm there I'll show you how it's done I'll, I've got some pieces there I can explain what's going on with the pieces and if you just uh, head out Carmel Valley Road we're just before Bocanugan Winery, which a lot of people seem to know where that is. So um, it's, a, it's a little building, and uh, pretty soon it will be all fixed up and, uh, and beautiful. Where are you exhibiting right now that if they're not in Carmel Valley, they can go see your pieces? Galleries. I'm at uh, Westbrook Gallery on Dolores in Carmel. Okay. And I'm at Montague Gallery on Sutter in San Francisco, just north of Union Square. Okay. And I've just signed up. Uh, to be in a gallery in, in Vienna, Austria, and a uh, gallery in Toronto, and you know, various galleries around the United States. And you can find that all that on my website, which is sandglass, S-A-N-D-G-L-A-S, with just one S at the end, dot com. It has all that information, and it has all the pieces that are available in the various galleries that I'm represented in. I'm just going to end with one little statement here where we're talking about specific place and then the spiritual aspect of, of your pieces. It, it does seem a bit contradictory to be creating contemporary sculpture in such a place as New Hampshire, but in reality, the <coughs> sculptures are a reflection of my inner space and what grabs my attention. I could be doing them anywhere. Actually, I don't question exactly where they come from. It's the mystery. Absolutely. The bottom end is, Tom, you can ask me what the hell I'm doing, and I, <laughs> I can't say I really know. <laughs> well, I've, I've had a chance to visit your studio and, and just take a, a yeoman's approach to understanding how you work with these pieces from its raw form. And it's, it's been completely fascinating to watch the uh, process. Oh, and, great. Uh, Glad you've been uh, All right, 28 West Carmel Valley Road. Yes, right on, right on the road on the right-hand side. Very good. Going out. Tolan, it's been a pleasure talking with you today. Absolutely. Thanks Tom. for coming. Thank, thank this you. This has been your town.